Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome back to YBC Revolt Talk. I am Tanya Dunbar, founder of YBC. Um, I invite you all to please go share, like, and follow all of our social media outlets on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel at YBC Revolt. Additionally, please reshare this active live so more folks can tune in as we will focus on getting smarter together. Um, so as we're getting a little bit, a few viewers here, uh, I'll give it just a, a minute or so so that some others can join and then we'll jump right in. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We have people joining and coming in. Again, please go like, follow, and share our social media outlets on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel at YBC Revolt, as well as share this active live as we want as many people to tune in as we have a special guest tonight. And we want to make sure that you all get this information. It is important for us to get smart together and understand how we can uh, make a better life for ourselves as well as generations to come. So we're gonna go ahead and get started tonight. If you joined us last time, we were talking about the racial disparities felt by people of color living in America. And in the episode, you know, we gave and ended the show with a call to action for black people. We said the time is now for us not to be silent, but to be seen and be heard. Um, since then, some of you have reached out to me and we have discussed what exactly did that mean? And we talked about it meaning several different things because there are so many actionable items that we as a black people need to be doing to help ourselves. But I asked those people to tune in tonight as we will be discussing one of those major action items, which is buying back our blocks, the power of real estate. I am joined tonight by YBC members Rachel Kaufman and Chantel Kelly. Thank you, ladies, for being here tonight. Good evening. Awesome. The mute button issues this time. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We need you to be able to be heard, girl. Heard. <laughs> um, also tonight, we have a special guest joining us, Erica Simpson. Erica is a real estate mogul, owner and broker of Erica Homes LLC, a boutique real estate firm based in South Carolina, but licensed to help people buy and sell in South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia. Erica springs new meaning to the phrase serial entrepreneur, as also the the owner of No Limit Financial, Apex Bell Bonding, and No Limit Auto Sales with three locations in Lancaster, Pageland, and Chester, South Carolina. She started her career in the classroom as a first grade teacher where she taught for five years. Erica is also the author of two books, Boss Moves, which is a children's book, and an informational book of real estate called Boss Up or Lose Out. She recently launched a virtual entrepreneurial school, Bossed Up Academy, that teaches and coaches entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs the best practices in business and that manifestation is real. They also focus on reiterating the importance of dreaming with your eyes wide open. Erica lives her life by the book of Matthew 21, 22, which states, and whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Please join me tonight in welcoming a special guest who is my friend, mentor, and my cousin, Erica Simpson. Oh, I'm so excited about being here tonight. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Erica, for being here. I'm really excited to have you join our platform um, and share all of your wisdom and knowledge. And I know you're going to drop a lot of gems for the people. So I hope that the viewers, you guys have your notes, you have your pen and your paper because she's going to give out good information. I already know this. <laughs> So we're glad to have you here. Um, for the viewers also, we invite you to please actively participate throughout as we'll be monitoring the comments for any questions you may have along the way. And uh, we'll be you know, trying to ad address those as we go along and uh, just know that Erica's open to um, answering any questions uh, as much as possible. Um, so tonight we're talking about buying back our blocks, the power of real estate. And 
This idea notion came from a movement that started three years ago by an organization called By the Block. Their whole premise was to create a one-stop online crowd investing real estate investment platform. And when they launched this movement, a lot of celebrities got on board like Rick Ross and T.I. Um, and they started to put their money where their mouth was in, in buying property in the areas where they're from. But I was reading an article in AARP and it says that only 18% of men and women from ages 18 to 34 say owning their own home is one of the most important things to achieve in their life. Erica, what is your perspective on the importance of property ownership? And what would you say more importantly is the value of property ownership uh, for the black community? Um, it all de it depends on your living situation, your life. Um, a lot of people will say, yes, home ownership. Well, if you are on a fixed income and you're a retiree, then it may not be beneficial for you to own. A lot of retirees actually sell their houses to go into a, in a retirement apartment where they don't have to worry about maintenance, um, different things like that. But for the majority, five percent of the people home ownership is a must a lot of people are unable to save money so building equity by just living in their house making their mortgage payments because real estate generally increases in value then that allows them to save money because they're building equity and a lot of people have to use their equity as their savings if they were to come into a hardship and needed money through a refinance to cash out or to purchase another property. Okay. All right. And um, based on that, like, what do you think for the black community is valuable in, in going either of those routes? I think that a lot of times, we as African Americans, we tend to, and you can see that in your parents or your grandparents, some of these older generations, where they did buy a property, mm. but they stayed in that one property for 30 years. They stayed in that one property for 40 years. Or now generations after grandma, now uncle so-and-so is living in grandma's house because he inherited the house and they right. never moved. So you have to have a purpose and because we're trying to bring financial literacy to people that you don't have to stay in the same place for 30 and 40 years. You can be mobile and you can get paid to actually move by cashing in on your equity when the market is hot and build and get something bigger, nicer, or downgrade and eventually pay cash for something and only overhead you have is taxes and insurance. So I think that you should invest in home ownership, not only home ownership for yourself, but to get into the investment aspect of this. Um, your first house could be the your first rental. So go in with a plan in mind and execute it. So know what your strategy is. Why are you doing this? Right. And you will come out a lot more successful in the end, just like most people that invest in stocks are usually more are wealthier than people who don't. The same thing with home ownership. Not only does home ownership provide you with equity savings, the financial aspect, but it's also been linked to children tend to do better in school when their parents own their house because they are not moving around as much they have stability um also with home ownership comes lower car insurance because now you get the homeowner's discount on your car insurance also you get the tax benefits of writing off now pmi is also a tax deductible is tax deductible along with your property taxes your hazard insurance so there's a lot more benefits than just building equity. And eventually, if you wanted to pay off the house, you don't have to worry about surging rent because now with the rental and gentrification, and we'll get into that, but 
with surging rental prices and you have to retire and you can't afford to live. Whereas that's a fixed number a lot of times unless you have a variable rate mortgage. Right, right, right. So it's almost like diversifying your portfolio from a property standpoint, similar to what people do on the stock front. Right. Um, so those are real, real good points and great information. And some of those other key topics that you touched on in there, we're going to come back to some of those here a little bit later. Um, but this makes me think about conversations that I've had with friends about the attempts that have been made to address promoting property ownership in black communities. Um, and it's been packaged in a a lot of different ways. Some call it gentrification, regentrification, or revitalization. But this approach doesn't always tend to reflect positively for the natives of these Black communities. Um, it usually means people are going to be pushed out and moved from their homes. For example, in the news over the past few years, um, there's been a revitalization project happening down in Overtown community in Miami, Florida, and where residents are were presented with by by city council with plans um, to update housing in the neighborhood, with the promise that residents would have the opportunity to apply and move back in. However, in these instances, oftentimes, not all the time, but a lot of times, um, those that are in the community will end up not qualifying per the application requirements, which then kind of forces them to have to move out. But based on this, Erica, what do you think are the effects of gentrification on communities of color? As you said, the issue with them being able to qualify to come back into the area, but also you have to think about, again, wealth that comes along with that. Um, and I'll just tell you about when gentrification was happening in DC. Um, one of my mother's neighbors, they were able to get over a million dollars for their house in as is condition. They packed up their stuff. They moved to South, I mean, not South Carolina, but North Carolina. They were able to buy a decent house for $250,000 and they still had a million dollars in their pocket. So that changed their life. So it depends on where you are in the process. Are you the one that's cashing out and relocating? They're not pushing people out a lot of times until it becomes that you're a minority in the, in the majority. But gentrification can't take place if we don't allow it to happen to start with. So a lot of um, our people will decide that, hey, this is going to put me in a better financial position. I'm going to take the money, reinvest it, and make more money. That's the same thing that happens all over everywhere. But as African Americans, we need to put ourselves in the position to be the gentrification, where the example I gave you with my mother's neighbors who got over a million dollars for their house, well, they divided that one house into condos. And then they started selling the condos for like $900,000 each. Well, they if, if they were to go into the um, development, which a lot of us are not doing, most of us mm -hmm. are on the lower level of, oh, I'm just going to be a realtor, buy and sell. We need to get into the commercial, the development part, because that's where the real dollars are. So, and then when you become a player in that state, then you can get the federal dollars by being a minority owned company. And a lot of us sometimes, and I know this is kind of disappointing to hear, but a lot of us want to be the front show, have our own show, and we don't want to piggyback or join up with other people. And that keeps us back as well, because if you're able to partner up, say you and I, Tanya, partner up, we're mm -hmm. able to pull our resources together. Now we have double the resources. If I, tr instead of me trying to go out here and do it alone, we go into a joint venture and we've got double the resources, then we can make things happen because a lot of times um, we are in business instead of business. We don't want to get the licenses. We don't want to get the, um, general liability that it requires so we kind of kind of check ourselves and not just blame other people for us not being a player in the game when we are not doing the prerequisites that's required to play so we need to get our general liability we need to form our corporations 
We need to get the minority certification. Most importantly, that I've been seeing during COVID-19 is getting those taxes together. We, do, we as a people don't want to pay Uncle Sam. You have to pay Uncle Sam. You have to take those tax returns because that's going to eliminate you for a lot of things. And that's happening not only on the gentrification part and development and getting federal contracts that will help you build things in these areas, but it's the same thing that's going on right now with getting assistance to keep people's business open through the different small business administration things right now because people don't have the proper paperwork. Right. Erica, what would you say about someone? Because I'm about to be a first time home buyer myself, but I'm finding difficulty trying to figure out where that's actually going to be. So what would you say to someone that doesn't already have a destination in mind of where they would like to buy, but they're trying to figure that out and narrow that down? Um, I would look and, and, and it's going to go back to the agent that you hire. Um, and you want to, and now with the um, internet being a healthy resource, you want to do some um, background check and things on your investigation and getting information on your own as well. But I would look, if you're not sure, and some people say, well, I don't know if I'm going to be here for a year or two. Nobody has a crystal ball to say what's going to happen down the road. But you want to look at the high appreciating areas where you know that, hey, if I sell in less than a year, values are going up in these areas. So I'm likely to be able to at least break even or cash out. So I would look at location is everything. Um, now with some of the first time home buyer programs, they do have them segmented to certain areas. Now, if you're able to use free funds to get your principal down because they're promoting home ownership in say rural areas or areas that are not as desirable for people, then if you're gonna get a big break on the cost of the house, that's going to give you instant equity so you don't have to be in a area that is going to appreciate as much if you've already come in, in the door with some equity through down payment assistance programs, grant programs through the state housing. And each state has a state housing program. And then you got in the, um, the city that you might be trying to buy in, they may have city grants as well. So when you stack all those things together, some people come out with fifty thousand dollars off the principal, off gate. So we have a um, questions uh, from the audience that I want to circle back to. Um, and someone was asking, is there a good age to buy a home? Um, as long as you're legal and to sign a contract, I would say at eighteen years old is a awesome time because that's going to put you so much further. That means that if you're going to do real estate investing, a lot of people now are turning their children on to invest because everybody's promoting um, entrepreneurship now and getting into the real estate because most millionaires are made through real estate, finance, and insurance and stocks. Those are the four top categories that produce millionaires you can't work a job a job is just over broke you've got to invest because you can't make money as fast as you can make it off an investment so i would say even if as a parent you know if you put it in a trust and you show your child and then sign it over to them or they become in control of that trust or that LLC, however you decide to set up that entity, I don't think anybody is too young to get in the real estate game. And the younger, the better. Also, um, that's just going to just, it's going to change your mindset. When you change your mindset, you change your net worth, you change your network. It, it, it just changes a lot of dynamics for young people as well as old people. So I would say any age, is a great time to get in the process, but to legally put yourself on paper when you turn 18. 
All right. So in uh, my real estate experience, one of the first ways, and we were talking about uh, gentrification and the, and the negatives of that and, and how we can change that 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 story and that scenario. Um, and one of the primary ways to counteract that is what we've been talking about, which is primary home ownership. And quite frankly, black home ownership is in a crisis, right? Um, it's coming back, but uh, home ownership rates for other racial groups have largely recovered since the 2008 housing crisis, whereas black home ownership has continued to decline. And it recently hit an all time low back in 2019. Now we're up, like, I think I read like three, you know, three and a half percent more back to a normalization of average, but it's still pretty low. Um, in fact, there's a statistic that says if black home home ownership rate were the same today as it was in 2000, we would have about 700,000 additional black homeowners. So with that being said, Erica, you mentioned earlier, um, but I wanted you to just circle back to it and repeat it so that people make sure that they hear it. And we'll, we'll be sure to recap some of this information um, in a post as well as uh, any notes against the YouTube channel. But can you tell people um, how they can get into home ownership, especially for the program through the programs that are available for first time home buyers number one rule then okay i think it was kind of going in that but yeah. the first thing i think is the issue is during the mortgage crisis the previous mortgage crisis back in 08 a lot of our elderly people were taken advantage of they were given substandard mortgages at higher interest rates and they had 700 credit scores so a lot of people had a um negative experience with home ownership because a lot of people lost their houses during that time and some people are not telling their counter they're not telling their um village the truth about why they lost their house they are giving them horror stories oh they threw my stuff out on the side of the road well, they didn't do that. You got notices. You knew that. Now, if you could prevent it, it's one thing. But another thing is to say they threw your stuff out. So they give people these nightmare horror stories about what supposedly happened to them. And it deters people from wanting to buy because they think, I'm going to lose my house and every, all my stuff is going to get thrown out on the side of the road when that is not the, at all the case and that there are resources if you come into a financial hardship most mortgage companies do have a loss mitigation department that will help you also a lot of times i think that our numbers are down because we don't want to budget and figure out exactly and then if somebody's got in over their head and you saw them lose their house because they were in over their head the first house you buy does not have to be the house you live in forever. It does not have to be your forever house. We've got to make that click. Let that be your stepping stone. Build you some equity. And if you want to sell it, buy you another house. And keep doing that and duplicate that and repeat those efforts. And eventually you'll find yourself in a half a million to a million dollar house. All you got to do, but you can't just come out of an apartment. And I'm not saying all people, it depends on your financial situation. But sometimes we want to leap too far ahead of mm -hmm. ourselves and don't realize, hey, that house isn't forever. Just because your parents lived in their house for 30 years don't mean you have to do the same thing. You know, you can be on a five, seven year plan, then go to your 10 year plan and keep moving. But again, like I said, Home ownership is le less than actually paying the rent on a deposit. Um, we rent properties, and I was just talking to somebody before I left work today, and I was saying we don't turn anybody down because we a lot of people get turned down even for rentals because of their credit and different situations. We don't turn people down, but there are additional things that they have to do financially in order to get in one of our places if they are challenged in certain areas. Well, a lot of those people could have taken that money or less money and bought a house with 100% financing. Like I said, you can stack those down payment programs on top of each other. 
and get your earnest money, your deposit, which is usually about five hundred to a thousand dollars, back at closing. And a, a rental will want five hundred two months of first month, last mm -hmm. month rental deposit, right. and you actually can get money back at the closing table. And now they have warranties um, for the houses because a lot of people are scared. Oh, well, I, if I'm making the house payment, but if my heat and air goes out, what am I going to do? They have home warranties for that. Um, just like you get an aftermarket warranty for a car, that a used car, they put a warranty on that used car. Well, guess what? They do the same thing for houses and you can buy that warranty and you can renew it on a yearly basis or you can pay for some of these warranties on a monthly basis so that it will cover those major repairs that you're afraid of. And you can have home ownership, get those deductions, because like I said, it's going to reduce your car insurance because now you're a homeowner. So they're going to give you a homeowner's discount and they're going to give you a multiple policy discount a lot of times. And you're going to be able to write off the interest, the PMI, the taxes off on your um, income taxes. So it's a lot of benefits to it, but you just got to have your strategy together as to what you want your end goal to be. And a lot of times they, um, they've got lenders out here that a lot of people are getting discouraged because of their student loans. There are lenders out here that will even take your student loans into account. Uh, we do have some programs where the student loans where some people will, you know, want a 1% payment, even if they are in deferment. There are programs out here that will take your student loan based on that income-based repayment plan, even if it's zero, even though you might have $100,000 in student loans. So you got to go with people that are knowledgeable and also do your own homework as well. Just like that. They say, read the Bible for yourself, do your homework for yourself, because there's a lot of opportunities out here right now to become a homeowner with no money out of pocket and actually sometimes getting paid to become the homeowner. Also with um, foreclosures, they have loans that will rehab that property into one loan. So you don't have to have money if you go into a house and you really like it and needs carpet flooring appliances you can get all that wrapped into your loan and because they the banks can't afford to take these houses back and take the losses and give the houses to investors so they have rehab loans um such as 203k loans um they have um rehab loans where you can actually get these houses fixed to your liking actually upgrade them Say they have for Michael countertops, you want granite. Guess what? They will put granite in it within your loan. So there's a lot of opportunities for first time home buyers. You just have to take advantage of it. Now, what would you say about someone that they're about to follow your advice? They want to get a property, but they can't decide between getting a property that they're actually going to live in their first house or getting a property that they would essentially become the landlord of and rent. Because I've, I've heard that a property that you're a homeowner of and a property that you're a landlord of, the the earn on the equity is different. It's a little slower on a rental property than it is a, a house that is yours, that you live in. That's not necessarily true because the property is the property itself. It doesn't matter who occupies that property. Um, it goes back to location, desirable condition, those kind of things, because you don't care if a landlord or an owner occupant is in that house if you want to live near Lenox Mall. You know, <laughs> I mean, you don't care who owns that property, but you're going off of what's going around it and you're comparing, okay, what can my money buy um, on ABC Street versus XYZ Street? And you looking, you know, you're going to compare based on that and you have no idea if it's a tenant in there or it's a homeowner in there but back to um another point that i was thinking about as you were saying that you know should you buy your first home or buy a rental 
Well, in my experience, um, my dad was a single dad. I had graduated from college. My dad and I were best friends. My dad passed away now, but we were best friends. So we loved living together. He was in his own space. I was on my own space. And I didn't use a first time home buyer program, but I used, um, and I'll just tell you how I did this. Um, I used my first pay, my first savings bonds for my down payment. And I bought rental properties. I lived with my dad and probably had 10 houses before I bought my first owner occupied house. So it doesn't matter. You got to, you know, when they say trust the process, you have to go on your own process. Your living situation may not be the same, um, you know, or sometimes I tell people, get you a roommate, go buy you a house, bring you some to you. And a lot of people, their first apartments, they got roommates. Why not go buy something? And they're like, well, my roommate ain't going to help me pay. They got to live somewhere. That's they're right. <laughs> yeah, it that's very you true. Know, Right. It's off of their budget. So guess what? Essentially, even if your roommate's paying your whole house payment, you paying zero. You still living with the same people, but you making money now. You just killed all your overhead. Most people are gonna say, Well, how much is your mortgage payment? Because we're not gonna be paying your whole mortgage. Well, if I was living in that apartment and we was giving up eight hundred dollars a month, and I tell you come move over here in my house and be my roommate over here for five hundred, what you gonna do? <laughs> Right. I'm going to move into the house. Like, yeah. <laughs> Most and people say, oh, and it's a better situation a lot of times because now we're in a house and we want to have some parties or whatever. <laughs> we're in an apartment. We ain't hardly have no parking and our neighbor complaining. So we just basically leveled up, you know? No, that's true. So you gotta, I mean, and I would not be opposed to a single person having um, some people now with Airbnb. You know, I mean, they're getting their house paid. Um, my One of my uncles, he rents out his basement. He never goes downstairs. Guess what? It's paying for the whole house. I mean, so you have to pick and choose. Now, some HOAs, homeowners associations, they won't allow you to rent. So you have to make sure or they have a rental capacity because they don't want the so many properties because they don't want to become a rental driven area. So you need to check with the HOA if you have intentions on renting the property right then, or if you're looking to live in the property and then become a future landlord, you need to know whether or not that property can be rented. Um, a lot of people don't look that far ahead and that could cause a problem for you or they could be at capacity when you get ready to rent it and you got to wait till they're not at capacity because they do want you to register rentals depending on the HOA. So that could happen as well. So Chantel, um, I think you, you were trying to chime in with something, right? I'm going to let you go. Yes, okay. yes. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of in the same um, position as Rachel. I am trying to become a first-time homeowner this year, but I'm going the investment route. Um, so I am buying um, a multi-property unit, and uh, this was so new to me, but I never knew that you can have an issue if the property was too cheap. Um, so if the property was too cheap, like it was too little to finance. Uh -huh. So um, that is something that I have come into contact with, with multiple banks where the loan amount isn't large enough or they're classifying it as a loan that they can't legally do because I guess um, the closing cost cannot exceed a certain amount of the hospital total and the, um, the financing total and it has to be under a certain point system. Um, so I say that to say, um, what, what advice or what can I do if I am a first time home owner who wants to get into an investment property um, but can't necessarily go the traditional financing route. 
So we want to I'm gonna hold on to that question, Chantel, because we're gonna talk about that. It is a topic in a little bit about investment okay. property. And I see a lot of questions coming in through the comments um relative to investment property. So we want to okay. circle back to that in just a minute. So just hold that thought. Okay. Um but before we uh it, and actually it's actually our next segment around the um investment property, but before we get into that, Erica, um you mentioned earlier about home equity and um the benefits of that, right? That people can gain that equity by being homeowners. Can you just describe for the people real quickly um, how they can make home equity work for them? Yes. Um, on your home equity, you can take out what they call a HELOC. That's a home equity line of credit. That's the acronym. Um, you can take out a line of credit. That's the, And equity is the difference between what you owe and what the property is worth. And you usually want it to be. And I'm using my hands to show you that you want what the property is worth to be up here and you want to be what you owe to be down here. So that difference in between is your equity. So say you have a property you owe $100,000 on, but it's worth $200,000, you get that difference is $100,000. And that's what I was talking about when I was talking about um, using those down payment assistance programs because you might be buying a house at one hundred and fifty. dollars and the house is worth 150 but now if I get a grant for this, a grant for that, you see how now this space is becoming larger in between my two hands, and now you got equity instantly, and then you, with the trends and the past of real estate, this part should continue to grow, so you're going to have more, so that. That's why I was saying take advantage. Um, Tanya, just before I forget, mm -hmm. she was talking about, and this could be an issue with people in like a lot of rural areas where property values are really low, where she's talking about they having trouble. A lot of places won't finance under forty or $50,000 a yeah. lot of times because they consider it to be predatory lending mm -hmm. because an attorney, and I just wanted to kind of, because that could go either way. It could go with a homeowner or an investor. It's not just see that that goes off of loan amount, which she was talking about. Um, because an attorney's gonna charge you what he's gonna charge, no matter if you get a yes, hundred thousand yes. dollar house or a fifty thousand dollar house, because paperwork is paperwork. Yeah. The only thing that's gonna change is your title insurance. So yeah. they're going to charge you, and I'm just going to throw out round figures here, $500. It don't matter what size house you use because okay. they got to compare mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the, the number. <laughs> they got to pull your credit report. So just because Oof, you buy yep. a $50,000 house doesn't mean that your credit report going to go down. The credit report is the same for a million-dollar house or a $50,000 house. Yeah. So right. all these fees that are just – Simple flat rate fees, no matter what, they feel as though it's high cost on a lower end property. Yeah. Now, this is and this is good for first, and I'm gonna link this back to the first time time home buyer since we kind of staying within the first time home buyer realm right now. Mm -hmm. But a lot of first time home buyers can run into this same thing, especially if they don't have a lot of income in those rural areas. So we do have a program that we work with through the government in rural areas for people that have a low income and we're able to get the government to subsidize their payment. So say their payment was going to be $400, the government now is the payment's going to be 600 and the government's going to pay $200 a month. But back to what she was saying on the low end, you can find alternative financing of people that do not have to go through the traditional mortgage lending process in order for it not to be considered predatory lending. Some of your small finance companies will finance some of those lower end properties. So even a first time home buyer, if they saying, you know, I want this double wide trailer out in the middle of nowhere for $28,000, it's going to be high cost when it comes to your big retail banks. But if you go to a small finance company that don't play by those same rules yeah. and they're going to give you a conventional loan, they may 
shorten the term, you know, as far as not giving you a 30 year mortgage, but they may put you on a 12 or a 15 year because you owe, you're, you're going to owe them a significantly lesser amount and they don't want to wait 30 years to get their money. Um, also, you can, um, they're, they're, they don't have the same guidelines. And a lot yeah. of times they will charge you a higher interest rate. Yeah. But just because they charge you a higher interest rate does not mean that it's a bad deal. Guys, and where were you? Where I needed you like a month ago. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, I'm sorry. I know we're going to go to another segment, but that's <laughs> going to happen. Like, I, right, I got a home. I, I was interested in a home and I, I thought I did so well by negotiating the price down. And I had an approval for three pays and then it fell through because the, the value went too low. And then I guess they were considered predatory lending for the fees that they had to charge. It was too much for this, such a small loan amount. So just shopping around to smaller banks and literally like 10 banks and had to find have a bank in a rural area. It was like, oh, but it, I I never knew that a home being teacher can be an issue. So that right. just that was that was insane to me. And it's still it's still a process, but yeah, it So you want so. to go with and you got non traditional um financing, especially if you're not gonna live in the property. Yeah. But we'll get into that. But just so that people aren't discouraged as a first time home buyers that's looking for that 50 and under range where they're going to say is predatory lending. Yes. Um, they may want to look at alternative finance. And I was going to give this example. I had a couple, they were going through foreclosure. They had an active foreclosure with a local credit union. They were not, they were going to be foreclosed on in like two months. Mm -hmm. We took them to an alternate finance company. They were able, going to buy a short sale for $27,000. The people owed a, over $100,000 on the house. This oh my is when God. short sales was really popular. And, and they were able to buy the house because we took them through this finance company, a local finance company. They had to put down 20%. Well, 20% on 27000 was roughly about 5000 bucks, right? Mm -hmm. So then they owed them like 22000 Their interest rate, I'm going to tell you what their interest rate was and why you shouldn't go off an of interest rate sometimes, depends on the situation. Their interest rate was 12%. Oof. Some people would have been like, oh my God, who's going to pay them 12%? They're nuts. They're crazy, right? They owed $22,000 on this house. Their payments were three thirty seven. dollars a month the house had a mortgage before the short sale over a hundred thousand dollars they were paying 12 percent interest rate but their payments was 337 where are you gonna rent a house for 337 a month with air conditioning oh nowhere <laughs> not even in not even in the ghetto as they say <laughs> right yeah. and they were on a 12-year mortgage now, when the market came back, how much equity do they mm. have? So, was that a bad deal for them? Absolutely not. No. Absolutely not. You have to look at the deal. Don't look at segmented parts of it. You got to look at the whole deal. Does it make sense? So, those people, they couldn't find an apartment. And half the people wouldn't even rent to them because they had an active foreclosure that was reporting on their credit report that they were more than a hundred a hundred and twenty days past due on this mortgage. Wow. That little finance company didn't care because guess what? It was such a small amount to them. They were going to get 12% interest. It was a locally owned finance company. They wasn't going to make 12% interest in the bank. So why not lend it to these people on this house, right? Mm -hmm. That was a win-win situation for the finance company. They got 12% interest. Those people got back into home ownership while they were being foreclosed on. And they were getting equity off of the short sale. 
And the other win was, where can you live for $337 a month? And they had like a four-car detached garage in the back of this house. So was it a win? Should they have paid the 12% all day long? Would you have paid the 12%? Probably so, all day long. And their house is going to be paid off in 12 years. Wow. So, so this is all good you information. Have to look at the deal yeah. that you're getting. Don't go off of segments. And that's another thing that first time home buyers, they want to look at the overall price of the house. Look at what's going to affect your monthly budget. Can you afford $1,200 a month? Don't bet that that house costs $300,000. Because guess what? You're not going to be looking at $300,000 every month. You're going to be looking at that $1,200 every month. So you need to look at what the payments are going to be, how right. it's going to affect you monthly, not the overall price. A lot of people want to get into the overall price, stay out of the overall price and go with what's going to affect you monthly. Right. So thank you, Erica, for that great information. Um, I'm sure people have other questions relative to first time homeowners and primary home ownership. And um, we'll be happy. Erica will definitely be sharing her information towards the end. So we'll talk about how um, you can get in contact to get adi- get additional questions answered and um, seek additional help in terms of services. But primary home ownership is like one method of buying back our blocks and counteracting gentr- gentrification in our neighborhoods. But another pe- another method that people are really interested in is the investment properties, the profit side of home ownership. Now, Erica, I know that while you own a boutique firm that helps people buy and sell real estate, you are heavy into property investment, hence the title real estate mogul. But there (laughs) are um, two methods to see a return on your investment for property, right? One method that people are always interested in is flipping houses. And obviously we all see all the flipping house shows on TV, but are flipping houses as lucrative as we see And what are some of the major risks that people should be cognizant of when getting into flipping houses? Okay. Big returns involve big risk. So the bigger the return, the bigger the risk. Now, if you're in it, and it's going to go off of your personality and who you are. I'm a risk taker. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And because my thing is fall down seven, get up eight, get up 28 that's a part of your process. That's the only way you're going to get better. That's the only way you're going to shorten that learning curve. You got to go out here. You got to get out of your mind and you got to get into execution. If you never fire the gun, you just sitting there with a loaded gun. It ain't doing it. It ain't going to kill nobody. (laughs) But if this person is attacking you, (laughs) you need to fire the gun, right? Facts. You sit there (laughs) and you keep unloading the gun nothing's gonna happen so you got to execute load it and fire it (laughs) is it going to work out the way you want it to every time no no but you minimize your risk by getting with mentors seeing how other people do things finding out from their mistakes learning from their mistakes um and now with the power of the internet and the power of coaching and stuff like that the the learning curve has been shortened so much you just gotta find the resources and actually utilize them so yes um flipping houses i tell people a lot of times you may want to start out with flipping houses especially if you don't have a lot of money because you want to build up some capital because if you go out here in rentals you got to have multiple rentals to make money because one repair can take you out for the year so i would say to build up a nest egg a security um blanket i would flip first um and you can start with wholesaling which don't require any money um and then you can move over to flipping properties Mm -hmm. and when you flip those properties how long most people don't even make $35,000 a year. A lot of people are at, on average are making $35,000 on a flip and depending on the area, 90 to 120 days. So if you duplicate that in every quarter, you're making $35,000. 
that's one hundred and forty thousand dollars a year. How many people going to work every day and not making one hundred and forty thousand dollars a year? A whole lot. <laughs> a, whole lot. <laughs> a whole lot of people for real. And that's um, what I'm right. Saying about you can't work. A job is just over I don't care yes. if you're a doctor or a lawyer. Anybody with any real wealth, they doing other stuff on the side. They investing in stock. They investing in investment group. They're investing in real. They are doing something on the side. Most people ain't just going. Even if you make it two hundred thousand dollars a year, you're gonna adjust your lifestyle to that two hundred thousand dollars a year, yep. and you go again are gonna be just over broke. We're broke, right? <laughs> right? Right? And you have to. And I and I talk about this, and I and I'm actually gonna do another video about it. That your health can't depend on your bills because your bills will keep coming. So I would say flip the properties, start off and you may want to do a joint venture back to what I, I was saying. A lot of us, we want to do it on our own. We want to be the person under the spotlight. We want to be, we never want to ride somebody else's coattail. We never want to partner up with somebody to duplicate the resources. Mm -hmm. Ego holds a lot of people back. Mm -hmm. You got to get in there with people. And there's people out here. And, I, and I'll tell you, people talk about haters all the time. Guess what? If you change your circle and you get with people that's got money, Ooh. it ain't so many haters. Because they ain't got time to hate on you. Mm -hmm. um, haters are usually broke people. I'm just going to be honest with you. That's the, the bulk of haters are broke people. So people that are thriving and doing well, they don't have time to deal with drama and messiness. They will help elevate you to the next level. So sometimes, in the words of Snoop Dogg, you can't take everybody with you. You <laughs> let some stuff go and let some people go. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, I would... Um, go into the flipping. Like I said, with risk comes um, with return comes risk, and you gotta you can't settle for being a failure. You gotta mm -hmm. get up, keep going, and keep making it happen. But don't be stupid either, and not want to listen to people. Right, right, right. So, um, like, like I said, get with mentors, get with people that's doing what you want to be doing. Um, mm -hmm. In the words of Oprah, get with people that's going to take you higher. And right. that's a part of doing that because once your mind changes, your mindset changes, that's half the battle. Mm -hmm. We fail because of negative thinking. Yeah. And you may not make $35,000 in your first flip. You might only make 5000 but how long is it going to take you to make $5,000 on your job and doing physical work for it? And how many headaches and stress you going to get for it. Mm -hmm. So, and then that's $5,000 to put in your pocket, not just functioning money, but you can use your job money for that until you're able to build that stability. Mm -hmm. And then I would switch over to the rental. Um, I did rentals first, just like I was saying earlier, because me and my dad had a good relationship. We loved each other. And we just... <laughs> You know, and so I got into the original business, but then I was able to buy so many properties and then I was diversifying what I was doing, too. So that way you can do that. Um, also, there's I mean, there's a ton of different methods on the way you do it, but you got to figure out, OK, do I need residual income or do I need large chunks of money? Mm -hmm. So. And everybody's situation is different. Some people, that I mean, I need this to be my side hustle. I need that extra coming in every month to help me maintain. Some people are like, no, nah, I need $50,000 because I got some stuff I need to do. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it all depends on what your strategy is, what your goal is, and I would go with that. And there's no right or wrong way to do it. You got to go for what's best for your situation. Yes, yeah, so I want to plug in a question real quick that came up earlier. Um, Kevin in the audience has said it, I wanted to know if listing a home on public housing is a good investment move. Um, a lot of people I used to hear would say, ah, I won't rent to anybody on Section 8. 
Um, that's most of your public housing. Um, actually, until we came into this rental shortage, most of my houses were rented through Section 8. Um, we don't have as many now rented through Section 8 because now people are so desperate for housing, decent housing. If you got decent houses and you're not a slumlord, people will let you put them on bank draft <laughs> to get your house. Um, but the positive with Section 8 is that checks will come in the mail, guaranteed, right. that, throughout okay. that lease. A lot of people are not going to lose their voucher because they tore up your house. Uh -huh. So a lot of people say, I don't want to rent to those people. They got a bunch of kids. They're going to tear up stuff. No, they have an annual inspection, and yeah. they'll find things that are beyond normal wear and tear that you can build a tenant for. And then if there's things that, you know, is prior to your maintenance upkeep, you know, they'll make you aware, you know, that socket needs to be fixed or whatever. Mm -hmm. But most people aren't going to tear up your house and lose their voucher. They're mm -hmm. free rent. Okay. So a lot of people have that misconception that people will tear up your house when you're taking a risk on somebody not paying your rent and tearing up your house. And there's nobody, no code enforcement coming through on a yearly basis to enforce and check and to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to buy your property. Amen. So um, I, I, I don't, I don't, as long as the person's voucher and some places won't allow them to pay money out of their pocket, but some places do, as long as I'm getting fair rent, I don't care who it is. Okay. So so we, either way. Right, right. So we have another um, question. This one is commercial property related. What are the first steps to purchasing an older commercial building that is in need of major renovations? For example, should, should you have an inspector and contractor come in prior to making an offer or would it follow a similar pro process for purchasing a home? I don't ever recommend doing inspections prior to locking the property down. You can always renegotiate the price um with people but if you go and you say i'm gonna get all these inspectors to come out you pay these inspectors and then i come in with cash and say i'm gonna buy the property from the the owner you just wasted money on inspections and i'm buying the property on a property you can't even buy mm -hmm. so most contracts come with a due diligence or some it depends on what area you're in they call them inspection period so at that time, once you lock the property down with a contract, is what I mean when I say lock the property down, then I would go in and do inspections and um, if I needed to and if the repairs were going to be more than I expected, then I would renegotiate the price at that time rather than trying to do, you know, putting a cart before the horse. Right, all right. Okay, so Erica, this has all been very valuable information, but before we go, I do want to hit on one last topic, and I would like for us to discuss um, discuss it because I know people are interested in this, and that is group buying or investment property um, group buying, and you talked about it, right, that people's egos get in the way, and they don't like to partner with uh, each other um, to understand how we can leverage um, each other to uh, and, and our means that we have to be more successful or build our own net worth, right? Um, so for those viewers that we have on who are looking to join or form a group and invest in buying a block, I have two questions. What are some ways they could start get started if they don't have 100K or more in capital? And what is one major piece of advice would you tell um, that newly formed investment group to consider? Okay, because I see a lot of these people now are doing this pooling somehow over the pandemic. These susus have come back and everybody Woo! wants to pool their money together. Goes back to mindset. Um, people don't know people into money is involved. And so I would highly encourage you to put everything in writing. Nobody is your friend when it comes to business and money. Um, That's true. If it's in writing, it ain't what I thought or what I say. We go, it's in black and white. There ain't no way to misunderstand, misconstrue anything when it's in black and white. So get it in writing. 
no matter and and if you're with people that are of the mind of the same mindset then they should understand that it needs to be in writing so nobody gets confused in their role their part may it be financial or i'm going to do the work or whatever it needs to be totally laid out so if there's an issue that's like your bible that you come back to and say hey this is where we are um and like i said it goes back to mindset knowing who or hoping to know those people and what their goals are and sometimes it's better not to work with friends it may be better to work with strangers people you don't even know so that way when you gotta fall out with them you still good <laughs> but, <laughs> we can still be friends um, I would say, but for the most part I, I say get it in writing that way there's no blur lines right and Does what's the answer your question yeah, and then the other part of it was just what are the ways that those um, groups can seek out funding where they don't have 100K or capital um, uh, already sitting to the side, right, by pooling their resources? Um, right now, um, we're in an entrepreneurial government. A lot of stimulus money, um, $12 billion is given to housing. Um, getting a GC license, getting your paperwork in order so that you can apply for some of this government contracts and government funding um, will be a game changer for most people. Um, you know, being able to get um, a government contract is going to give you automatic funding if you're able to be awarded that. Also, it goes back to private money. There's a lot of private money out here because people that have millions of dollars or are pooling money and we see a lot of money coming from China and different places they want to make more than they can make in the bank so they le lessen their guidelines but they drive the interest rate and again remember it depends on the deal whether or not you should do it but some of them are loaning money between 7 to 10 11 percent and it's on nobody's personal credit and it can then you have to sign an affidavit saying that it won't be owner occupied and they're using your llc or your s corp or whatever your entity is you can't do it in your personal name and it doesn't show up on your personal credit when you're dealing with a lot of these private money entities because they don't want to have to play by those rules with the predatory lending uh -huh. that she was talking about um, and then if you don't pay, they can execute and, ex and accelerate their clauses to get their property. Um, but they tend to lower, um, a lot of times their loan to value is a little bit lower, but it also depends on the property. Um, the amount of work that's being done when you have your um, scope of work that's being done, what the comps are as in what they call as is condition with the properties like right now versus in a rehab condition so there's a lot of private money out here there's money for anything that you want to do you just got to go find it and apply for it awesome and a lot awesome. of it is not a lot of people worried about their credit you do need that um a lot of times you know you want to have decent credit they don't want to deal with people that's got bankruptcies and stuff but a lot of the private money may be property driven rather than credit driven so they're, they're going solely off of that property and what you're going to do with that property what's your um what they call an exit plan how are you going to get out of this property you know may it be a long-term rental or you know are you going to flip it or whatever you got to tell them if so if you were to get in jeopardy with this property how are you going to get out of it with your exit plan and Generally, a lot of them don't even take tax returns or anything. They're going strictly off of that property. So there is mm -hmm. private money out here. You just got to go find it, find out what the guidelines are, and use it. 
Awesome. Well, Erica, thank you for joining us tonight and sharing such valuable information and all, dropping all these gems. We promise to um, circle back and, and, and list out some of the resources that Erica mentioned tonight um, on our post so that you guys can um, follow up and, and check into these. But Erica, can you please let everyone know how they can reach out to you and where to follow you at on all your um, multi <laughs> multiple businesses and outlets? <laughs> I am all over social media. Um, right now, um, you can follow me on my personal page, Erica Simpson, but I'm at my friend limit right now. So, um, <laughs> you can follow me. Um, feel free to message me on Messenger. Um, I have Boss Up Academy. Um, it's bossedupacademy.com. I have ericahomes.com. I have apexbellbonding.com. I have no limit LLC.com. <laughs> Um, I'm on Instagram as um, SC Real Estate Boss, um, Bossed Up Academy, and then I'm on Facebook um, on Bossed Up Academy, Erica Holmes, No Limit, and Apex Bell Bonding. And then I have a Erica Holmes YouTube channel, and I have a Bossed Up Academy YouTube channel. So I'm pretty much everywhere on the internet, so you can send me a message. Um, if I can't personally answer your questions, um, I have staff that does help assist me with getting people's answers done. We do um, business consulting as well as helping people get set up in different businesses and to scale those businesses. Um, like right now, the big one is um, PPP, and you actually can file PPP if you've got rental properties. Because, and even if you're in a partnership with some other friends, um, as long as you got a positive cash flow, and you also can apply for EDIL, there's a lot of money out here right now, but you got to find out what it's for, how it's to be used, so that you don't get in trouble with the government either, because they like the mafia, they'll seize your base bank accounts, but right. um, huh. there's, I mean, there's a lot of benefits, so flipping houses, doing rentals is a business of itself and people don't see a lot of times that being a small business they just think of something they're doing in real estate well it's actually a business so you are entitled to the benefits that are out here for small businesses so um and then um my number is 888-816-BOSS so um message me reach out to me um and like i said if i can't uh, if i can't answer your question i'll find out the answer i'm like a sponge for knowledge i want to know everything i don't yes. want nothing you know i don't want somebody <laughs> asking something i don't know but i'll go find out i'll like, get back with you because i do like to know stuff and i like to research stuff um but between my office and myself we generally can answer almost any question somebody has almost immediately most of the time Great. Thank you again, Erica, for being here. Um, with markets rising, there's a great opportunity, y'all, to buy houses now uh, for home ownership as well as investment property ownership. And considering today's market, we should definitely be promoting Black home ownership for many reasons, including investing in our futures. Additional benefits from property ownership include U.S. tax breaks, um, uh, equity lines, and most importantly, investing in our communities, all things that we talked about and discussed tonight. Uh, besides property ownership has been a key path to wealth creation and stability for generations of Americans. So why should it not also be a key path of wealth for the black communities? This has been another episode of uh, YBC Revolt Talk, Buying Back Our Blocks, The Power of Real Estate, where we have been live and we have been real. Please join us next time, Thursday, July 16th at 7 p.m., as we will have uh, YBC member Harold Booker moderating, where D1 referee Gerda Gatlin will be joining us to discuss the crossover, a journey from sports to tech. But before we go, I'll leave you guys with this one last thought. Madam C.J. Walker said, I had to make my own living and my own opportunity, but I made it. Don't sit down and wait for the opportunities to come. Get up and make them. So let's continue to keep getting smarter together. Until next time, this has been YBC Revolt Talk.